Thank you, Chris. And uh, I was uh, frantically uh, putting together my presentation, uh, trying to integrate all the uh, really exciting and spot on ideas, comments, suggestions. And to help me with that, thank you so much, Cheryl, for having put together this wonderful diagram. Excellent. That's going to be my framework from which I will uh, speak. And first to Chris and to all of you that have brought us together for this Aging Initiative Summit, congratulations. Uh, it's just uh, an exciting and important development that CalSWIC and social work and California is demonstrating how a profession can get ahead of the curve and begin to make a difference in a, in a, in a trend that is going to, in many ways, influence, us, influence society and in some ways perhaps overwhelm us. So I commend you all. Also for each of you here, I commend you for hanging in there. I didn't expect more than five or six people <laughs> by three o'clock in the afternoon. <laughs> so I, I walked outside and I saw all this sugar out there, so I hope you all took advantage of it because I know I need it right now. But in either event, uh, it's great to be here. Uh, for the, thank you for giving a little bit of my, about my background, Chris. It's already in your program, which for those of you who knew I was for a short while chair of our social work department, it answers the question why I'm not chair because I'm on sabbatical and I'm back east again and uh, taking care of a whole lot of other things like entitlement reform and disability and long-term care. Uh, but in either event, my heart belongs in social work, my heart belongs in California, and so I was just so happy I could be here with you. So, uh, what, what can we do? Uh, first of all, if you'll look to your right, and uh, this is the FTG framework, on the top, paradigm shift, on the bottom, refraining, reframing, repositioning social work, to the left, the Affordable Care Act, to the right, aging, and then three levels which have been alluded to already, uh, the policy macro level, the intermediate meso level, and I would say short term, but it's really soon, as in real soon, we got a lot of things to do, uh, the micro uh, level. Uh, and so I'm going to be referring to that, and I think it'll help me uh, throw in a whole lot of things and uh, give some uh, semblance of uh, coherence to it. Uh, first of all, uh, everything I've heard here I think pretty well gives us the roadmap uh, that we need and uh, truly the expertise, the passion, the commitment, the sophisticated insights that are necessary for social work to be a more influential player, not just in aging, but with the development of this dramatic new healthcare system. It's all come out in this room in, in so many different ways. And again, that's kudos to all of us. Uh, kind of on the paradigm shift, uh, I don't think, I do not think we can overstate that we are in fact in, the, in a period of a major dramatic evolution in how this country for the foreseeable future will address health and medical needs of this country. Uh, notwithstanding the election, notwithstanding what might happen in 2013, I doubt very much that we will go backward. I doubt very much that we will see a repeal of the Affordable Care Act. And if for any reason it was repealed, let's just say that our friends in the Republican Party uh, were able to elect President Romney and give us a Republican House and Senate, by repealing the Affordable Care Act, it would in fact create a momentum for a single payer plan. They know it, the world knows it, so you're not going to see it repealed. It might be gutted, it might be scaled back, but the public increasingly realizes, hey, there's something in this Obamacare that we need and we need to preserve. So I think we can just assume for now that for the next 5, 10, 15, 20, 30 years, the Affordable Care Act not only is here to stay, but is going to dramatically reshape how we address health care in this country. The second reality is an absolute certainty. This country will get older. 
we will age. <laughs> There'll be many more of us that will reach senior citizenhood, uh, and many more of us that are already eligible for AARP membership. And I just say that because aging is no longer a trendy issue. It's here to stay. I mean, I'm sounding kind of trite and cute, but the point here is that aging, longevity, increased life expectancy, greater numbers of persons that will be considered older adults is going to drive this paradigm shift and that will clearly be one of the top domestic concerns facing this country uh, for many years. But I think the corollary to that is therefore uh, that question as to why we're here. What is the role of social work and the social work profession and the principles and values in social work education? We're here to address those questions, but I think I can say something that won't be too provocative. Uh, we are not in the driver's seat. We are not yet in the driver's seat in terms how social work will be a player with the implementation of the Affordable Care Act. We're not in the driver's seat yet in terms of how this country responds to the social health, housing, transportation, quality of life issues facing an aging society. We're making tremendous contributions. We're making progress, but given the enormity of what is occurring in this country, and for that matter, much of the world, we have a lot of work to do and a whole lot of catch up. And why we're here is certainly a very important step in that direction. And then uh, lastly, uh, before I go into a little more specificities, I really like some of the comments and references to the concern that, uh, and I think uh, Gretchen said it best, you know, how can we get people to respect us, to like us, to include us? I think we are all smart enough to know that it's not enough to be cute and cuddly, that it's not enough to say, we're good people, we're on a noble mission, we care, therefore, please be nice to us and include us in the games that you play. Uh, that doesn't cut it, and that gets to what is the reality driving the Affordable Care Act? And somebody used a wonderful word. It's a gold rush, a gold rush. It reminds me of the historic legislative history of the Medicare legislation of 1965, which was heavily opposed by the medical profession, by the hospitals, by the AMA, by the doctors, by the health professions. But once it was implemented, they rushed in and they controlled the implementation of the Medicare legislation. And they controlled it for the same priorities that they are rushing in for control of the Affordable Care Act. First and foremost, it is about control. Who will have jurisdiction? Secondly, it's about revenue and profits. Thirdly, it is about efficiencies and trying to find a way to do things better. And lastly, it's about the consumer and giving a better quality of care about the consumer. Did you see how I prioritize those four? Our dilemma and our challenge is that we come into it with number four as number one. Shall I say that? You know, for the MDs, the MBAs, the for-profit chains, and the hospitals, and the medical industrial complex, their first priority is who will have control. Their second is how much money can we make. The third is how can we reduce costs. And then fourth, oh, by the way, we want to provide increased enhanced health care coverage for patients. And I'm not trying to be too cynical. For us, we're coming into it first with we want to enhance a quality of life for our constituents. And therein, I think, lies our dilemma. That's, in many ways, our fundamental disadvantage in how we're going into this. Therefore, if I had my first messages, I think we need to be both honest, critical and self-aware, and smart. And all those elements were evidence here in the room with the many wonderful and spot-on 
ideas and suggestions. And, but lastly, I would say we need to be able to do what I sometimes call, refer to my students an out-of-body experience. That is to put ourselves in the shoes of a CEO of Blue Cross or Anthem or uh, HCA or put ourselves in the shoes of uh, the different uh, uh, medical doctor specialties and associations and ask ourselves, how do they look at this? How do they look at this? And uh, if, I was a, if I was an outsider, not part of social work or gerontology, but I was someone who at least understood the trends and had a sense of, I care and I want to do good things, I would essentially look at the Affordable Care Act very, very closely. And I would require or recommend that we all read that huge several hundred page bill carefully. And then that would allow us to kind of answer uh, this question. After we achieve some kind of universal health care, after we create the health care exchanges, and California was the first, after we sort out the care coordination management and the new efficiencies and the new innovations and the rearrangement of that medical hospital uh, uh, industrial complex, then who will focus on the individual? Who will have a priority with the families and the communities outside that acute medical system? Who will take responsibility or ownership over the longer term needs of individuals who are no longer in that medical health system? Who will it be? Who should it be? And then I ask myself as objectively as I can, well, doctors are well trained and they seem to be nice people. Then I have to answer, but that's not their focus. Nurses, PTs, OTs are nice people and well trained, but that's not their focus. MBAs and healthcare executives are certainly sophisticated about the finance side of healthcare, but they don't care. <laughs> <laughs> And then, I, and then when I go down the line, you know what I come to? There's a profession out there that has made it their business for the last 20, 30, 40 years of building their work around where the individual has their life. And you know who that is? Social work. Social work. And so I'm not saying that to make us feel good. I'm just saying that because if I approached it from the other side, I would conclude I don't really want to deal with that messy, convoluted, fuzzy area of home and community-based services, of long-term social services and support, of providing the care coordination outside the medical acute care uh, arena of having to actually be in the home of these old people or their families or their caregivers and making sure that somebody follows up over the subsequent 30, 60, 100, six, nine months a year. And when we think about that, then I think it begins to give us a sense of answering a critical question. What does social work bring to the table? What does social work bring to the table? And that's a question that I would pose in a boardroom of healthcare executives, of healthcare executives, being able to walk in, speak their language, and essentially answer our rhetorical question, what do we bring to the table? And that gets me to uh, going back to my thing there. First of all, What we bring to the table, kind of to restate, is we'll take care of the messy part that you don't want to take care of, or you don't feel qualified to take care of, or that section or segment of this new Affordable Care Act and the establishment of a different approaches to universal health care. We'll take care of that part which on the surface does not appear to give the level of revenues or profits 
that uh, the medical profession and hospital chains are looking for. We'll offer to give you the best practice models which were featured here earlier in the panel in terms of here's how we can work in a way that's manageable and cost efficient and affordable and is within where your constituency or clients are likely to be. And we come to you not as competitors, but as partners, as partners that will work with you to make your job easier. Now we're talking to the docs, the health, the, the health care uh, executives. We're coming to you as your partners. But we not only want respect, we got clout and we got leverage and we're not afraid to use it if we think you're not responding or including us at the table in the way we want. So that's kind of my generic how I think we can begin to reposition, reframe our value added and what we bring to the table. But now let me step back. We have a lot of work to do, folks. We have a lot of work to do. Uh, first of all, we have not yet, and this goes to the soon micro level, we have not yet gerontologized the social work profession sufficiently. And there was a number of comments which I see firsthand in our program at UCLA. We talk a good game, but can we deliver? And by that I mean we have a hard time getting more than 10% of our incoming MSW students to commit to gerontology. As hard as we tried, even with the Archstone Foundation grants and other support, even when we try to bribe our social work students with support, it's tough to get more than a small proportion to take an interest in aging. And we're proud that they're, they're more interested in child welfare. That's wonderful, and that's what the IUC program is for in Kelswick. We're proud that they want to work in DPSS. We're proud that they want to be involved in mental health. But we have a lot of work to do to begin to increase a cadre of our MSW students who will be around the next 10, 20, 30 years that you really need to know this stuff before you go out there. Of course, a lot of them are gerontologized along the way, and the rest of them, whether they like it or not, are going to be gerontologized when they realize that a growing number of their caseload are older persons. I mean, it's going to happen eventually, but we have a lot of work to do in terms of getting more students interested. We have a lot of work to do at this sooner rather than later in terms of modernizing our curriculum. And now, uh, I know we have a lot of wonderful friends from CSWE, uh, so please take this with total respect. Uh, <laughs> We're trying, for example, UCLA to, do it, to enhance our macro curriculum so that at least our core group of general students and macro students can begin to get some courses in finance, in negotiations, in public budgeting, in leadership, in critical thinking. It's so hard to get that in the curriculum because CSWE has so tied our hands with such a uh, micromanaged curriculum. Someone made reference to the MSW curriculum is probably 20, 30, 40 years old. And that's not bad. It came out of a wonderful period of time. But I guess what I'm saying is that if we are truly going to be part of reframing and repositioning and being part of this paradigm shift, maybe we ought to give some thought to can we further modernize our curriculum and by the way it's not just because of the Affordable Care Act or aging. I mean when you have this shift in terms of the state shifting more of their programs and services and responsibility to the county level when we have technology and IT becoming such a big part as well as social media I mean there's so much out there that is dramatically changing how we address social conditions and problems that alone speaks towards modernizing the social work curriculum but that's a responsibility of others who are much more expert at it than I am but um, I'll leave it at that that's kind of one of my pet peeves I've already talked about we have highly successful models and uh, but we have more work to do many of our models as presented here like MSSP and others within the long-term services and support or long-term care are facing one reality 
There is no long-term care in the Affordable Care Act. The demise of the Class Act, which I worked closely with uh, in HHS with uh, Kathy Greenlee and, and, and uh, Secretary Sebelius, and as part of that, we finally did something that we thought it, we think will be a, a good foundation. We're finally bringing together all the disability programs in HHS with the Administration on Aging, the Aging and Disability Resource Center. We now have them in a new agency for community living. And so we're at least trying to centralize, consolidate programs that could be either home and community-based services, but certainly the different programs for the younger disabled, as well as AOA, the AAAs. We're bringing them together, but the Class Act is on hold. And there seems to be no appetite in the Congress right now, or for that matter, in the administration. And our friends in the Republican Party have made no reference to long-term care. So much of what we can bring to the table in terms of successful models of care coordination are about long-term care community-based services. Yet, the dilemma is the Affordable Care Act is not about long-term care. So in terms of jumping up ahead at the policy side, I am confident that in the next three to five years, there will be a growing social movement that will result in legislation to revive the class act. So let's just be ready for that. Other work that we have to do to begin to wind down, workforce development shortages. Uh, I think we're well aware uh, with the full implementation of the Affordable Care Act, we're going to have a huge shortage of primary care physicians. I know that for those of you from rural areas, you're acutely aware of today how difficult it is to get uh, your uh, highly sophisticated hospitals, to get to community clinics, the issues of transportation, uh, the issues of distance, et cetera. For those of us from the metropolitan areas like Los Angeles or even the, the Bay Area, we have to remind ourselves that uh, Northern California does not begin in Santa Barbara or Marin County, that a whole third of the state north of Marin and north of Sacramento is a true northern rural frontier of California, and they have a whole nother set of challenges and issues. But in either event, uh, the issues of shortages, not to mention the shortages of uh, geriatricians and, ger and nurses and others trained in, uh, in uh, gerontology. Intermediate uh, issues, uh, while we work to position ourselves to show what we can bring to the table, let's look at alliances as well and uh, coalitions. And I would suggest that you have a, an important ally in what we are trying to accomplish, and that is the disability rights movement. Um, I work on that. I'm vice chair of the National Council on Disability, working with the younger disabled groups. They're beginning to realize two things, two certainties, two reality. The good news is they're living longer. Just about every uh, class of disability, whether it's Parkinson's or Down syndrome or post-polio, or spinal cord injury are enjoying added years of longevity, which is moving them into the traditional old age criteria of 55, 60, even 65. They're becoming concerned because they're now having to face, wow, now I have to be eligible for these programs for the elderly. But the not so good news is they're very concerned that their history of focusing on independent living uh, now is coming face to face with our focus, which has been home and community based services that enable individuals to take care of themselves. But in either event, there's a lot that we can do with the disability community. Another very important ally for us, veterans, veterans, particularly those from Afghanistan and Iraq who we've been working very closely. These are young men and women with uh, high survival rates because of the extraordinary progress in military medicine. But the other side of that coin is they're going to live longer lives with severe injuries. Uh, the VA and the Pentagon has barely begun to talk about, wow, after we stabilize, put them through rehab, get them home, what do we do with the 21-year-old young male or female who will have another 40, 50 years, and how, who will help their families, friends, caregivers with all the necessary supports that they will need, which is, by the way, 
what we're all about. So I would just suggest that. Marketing has been raised, very important. Outreach has been raised. And then to wind up back on the policy side, uh, we have had some real successes, thanks to all of you. And um, references have already been made to the behavioral component of the Affordable Care Act. Social work as a profession is now one of the seven that will be uh, eligible for reimbursement that is at the table. That was a huge victory. It happened in California, and you all should take a lot of credit for it. It shows that, in fact, we can play the game. We can be there with the big boys and girls if we're willing to be aggressive, assertive, and not so nice, not so nice in terms of pushing uh, what it is that we can do to enhance the success of the Affordable Care Act. Lastly, I'll just say this. Uh, the pending implementation of the Affordable Care Act, which is scheduled to begin in 2014, is not the end. It's just the beginning. It's just the beginning. Like any other piece of major legislation, whether it was the Affordable Care Act, Social Security, Medicare, whatever, uh, there's going to be so many imperfections, so many things that no one thought about, so much push and pull from the various interest groups, interest groups that don't like what they're seeing and feeling, and so much pressure from the public about it ought to be done this way or a better way, that we're going to go through a number of years of constant legislative amendments, modifications, and changes which is why I recommend that at least those in CalSWIC and in social work that are focused on, uh, on aging go through at least a detailed summary of the Affordable Care Act because there's going to be constant changes for the next several Congresses, uh, ses sessions of Congress. That's where we can then make another set of accomplishments, contributions, where we can, in fact, influence what the changes and modifications will be to the Affordable Care Act in the years to come. But our work is only just beginning because we're going to see big changes as well in Medicare and Medicaid, Medicare and Medicaid. Uh, irregardless or regardless of who wins the elections in 2013, it's kind of ironic. We've been talking about this back in Washington, D.C. If Mr. Obama should retain his presidency, there's a growing likelihood that there will be a, a grand bargain in the lame duck session of this Congress between November 6 and January 6, uh, where in fact uh, the leadership of the House and Senate, the key White House staff who actually control much of what's going on, and the White House and President will come together and essentially say, before we face that fiscal cliff in January, let's just make the hard, tough structural changes to Medicare, Medicaid, potentially Social Security. Uh, that's going to happen real, real quick. Uh, and whether it means raising the eligibility age in Medicare, whether it means striking a bargain with state houses and governors to move towards a, uh, a privatized or partial block granting of Medicaid, whether it means capping the growth of Medicare and Medicaid, we can be certain that there's going to be huge changes in the structure and how the benefits and eligibility will play out in both those programs. Uh, that's going to impact, by the way, the Affordable Care Act and how it's implemented. It's going to impact, certainly, our constituency, the elderly, the disabled, the, the, the medi medis. Uh, so we need to keep very close watch on that. Ironically, in some respects, our best, let me, let me restate that. I've got to say this carefully. I can get in trouble. Uh, <laughs> Uh, let me restate this diplomatically. We will have more time to understand and be prepared and to be involved if hypothetically Mr. Romney became president. <laughs> because it's going to take him at least one to two years to figure it out. <laughs> I shouldn't say it that way. We have to be respectful and bipartisan. And, and it's really clear that his advisors and his key staff who will have to move in and find out where the bathrooms are and how the telephones work it'll be well into the end of next year before they're prepared for that grand bargain. But in either event, there's going to be uh, changes. 
and uh, so we need to be ready for that. In either event, uh, you and we can feel very good about where the aging initiative has taken us. Uh, we probably have the best minds of any state in terms of social workers that have the commitment, the knowledge, the sophistication, and the expertise. We have the best practice models. I believe we in this room and this state have a heightened level of self-awareness where we know what we can do and what we cannot do. We know the importance of not over-promising or raising undue expectations while at the same time trying to position ourselves to be players. And uh, in either event, I'm feeling uh, confident that uh, we will be even more important and influential in a kind of ironic, bittersweet way. All the trends are on our side. I've already mentioned aging, but if you look at the growing social and economic disparities, it's only getting worse. I thought for those of us that came of age in the 60s and 70s that we would have solved all the great problems of societies and created a just and equitable society. We took two steps forward and we're probably now four or five steps back. Uh, I do want to commend uh, pres uh, candidate uh, Romney uh, for his intellectual courage in letting the American people know exactly where he stands. <laughs> that there's 47% of the population who he essentially considers bottom feeders, uh, that they're a drain on society, which, by the way, comes from Ayn Rand. It's a, it's a poll. Uh, his vice presidential candidate, Ayn Rand, have essentially said, there are the givers and there are the takers. And to Mr. Romney's great credit, he hasn't backed down on this. He's for the givers, and everybody else no longer matters. Uh, I just came from a NASCAR race in Richmond, Virginia last week. Why a NASCAR race? <laughs> and what does that have to do with social work, aging, paradigm shift, and all these other good things? Uh, as you may know, because I don't have enough to do, I'm also on the board of AARP. And uh, we were facing uh, some of the similar dilemmas that you all are facing. How do we position ourselves, not just for to entice aging baby boomers to, you know, buy an AARP membership card. But how do we get beyond the view by a segment of the public that we're a left-leaning commie organization? And the Tea Party in particular is heavily composed of older whites, retired, marginal in terms of just barely above the poverty line, very dependent on Medicare and Social Security, heavily in the southern states. And we thought about it, we thought about it, Jesus, how do we get to that table? How do we show them that we're relevant to their concerns? And how do we position ourselves to appeal to, by the way, most, a majority of 65 and over voted against President Obama and opposed Obamacare, opposed the Affordable Care Act, keep in mind. The elderly are the greatest opponents of much of what we're trying to do. So how do we position ourselves with this constituency? The answer, buy a race car. Buy a race car. <laughs> so we are sponsoring uh, Jeff Gordon's number 24. I was just there with Jeff Gordon at the Richmond Speedway, and we're thrilled. He's in the sprint. And being there, it was a whole nother experience. Those of us from California, especially from the Bay Area and Los Angeles, you know, we think the whole world is cosmopolitan, diverse, progressive. <laughs> Go to the southern states. But I have to be real careful how I say this. Uh, it is so white, conservative, traditional values. We have made tremendous inroads, we AARP, because we not only bought the car, but we made it the catalyst for our drive to end hunger among the elderly. Jeff Gordon is one of our greatest ambassadors. When we first went there three years ago, we were actually booed among the 100,000 fans. Now we go there, people come up and thank us and applaud us. It took us three years to kind of turn around our image. So I just shared that little anecdote. Uh, we need to turn around our image. 
we need to turn around our image. And as we do so, uh, not we will get to the point where we no longer have to argue our case. Others will applaud us because they will know we're committed to that segment of both aging and health care that no one else can do better than we can. So I commend you. Stick with it. We're all in this together. Thank you very much.